Today, our topic is going to be the history of food. We have two really great guest speakers today. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Allison Brooks. Allison is a professor of anthropology at GW, as well as a professor in the Elliott School, um, here in the Elliott School of International Affairs. Dr. Brooks also serves as the director for the Center for the Advanced Study of Hominid Paleobiology, which she's going to, I'm sure, tell us all about today. Um, she's a paleoanthropologist and a paleolithic archaeologist who has worked in numerous locations around the world, Africa, France, the Levant, northern China. And in addition to teaching at GW, uh, Dr. Brooks also works for the Smithsonian Institution as a research associate, and she's a fellow with the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brooks. Well, I feel a little bit that doing the history of human diet or diets in 45 minutes is a little bit like the people who put together the on the morning news something called the world in 90 seconds. Um, it's only worse. Um, but I thought I would try to give you a sense of what we know about what we are really designed to eat as humans. In other words, we are the product of millions of years of evolution during which we did not eat Big Macs, we didn't eat yogurt, we didn't eat all these things that I'm sure you're eating now. So you, you might think, as I'm talking, one of the things you might just think about, because we were going to ask you to do this, but somehow it didn't get done, is see if you can count the number of plant foods that you ate in the last two days. That includes wheat, if you had bread, or lettuce, or I mean, the last time I tried this, um, most people had eaten four things, french fries, lettuce, bread, and ketchup. <laughs> that, was the, that was the vegetable food. So um, think, so you'd eaten tomatoes, bread, um, potatoes, and um, lettuce. Okay, so um, it was a lovely mixture of old world and new world foods, as we'll see. Um, but see if you can come up with more. I'd be really interested to know how many people got beyond five. If you could just have a show of, show of hands toward the end. Oh, wow, this, is, this class is really uh, moving you here. Um, how many people got beyond 10 in the last two days? OK, that's a much smaller number. Because um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about people who eat 105 different kinds of plants every year. So let's start out with the. Uh, the idea that um, I'm going to talk about early human dietary needs, new directions, and what was different from the diets of our close relatives. Then I'm going to talk briefly about the cooking revolution, which seems appropriate since the figurehead of this course is a chef, um, about new technologies for hunting and fishing a little bit, the agricultural revolution, how early cities changed the way we eat, and finally, the Columbian Exchange and its effects. So this is a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to try to get through it. Um, so let's first of all say, or agree, that um, a few million years ago, we started out as African apes who were starting to walk around on two legs. And you can see in the middle picture, that's a bonobo in the middle, a chimp on the left, and a gorilla on the right. That all of them walk on two legs some of the time, but they're not really adapted to do it. That's the difference between what you can do and what you can do easily. They're not adapted to do it because their legs don't slant in towards the, I mean, when we walk, we can pick up one leg and balance on the other one. If an ape does that, their legs are out on the side, so they have to kind of balance their weight, <laughs> go walk around like this. Um, so what are we, if we extend that to food, what are we designed to eat? What do, what do we do? We share so much of our DNA with these apes. There's only 1% of our DNA that's different from theirs. Um, how come we don't eat the same things, or do we? So what do apes eat? OK, as apes, we have to have amino acids and proteins, which for apes come from meat especially from insects, that's one of their major foods, ants, termites, um, and from young leaves, which are, can be very high in protein. Some apes also crack nuts, like the ones on the lower right. There's are chimpanzees cracking, using stones to crack nuts. Um, also, fats and oils 
are important in our diet. Again, insects can have a lot of fat in them. Nuts can have lots of oils and protein, and some fruits with seeds. Carbohydrates are an important source of energy, so fruits for apes and aquatic tubers, <laughs> things that grow at the bottom of a swamp. And then, because their food is varied, they need vitamins, minerals, and elements. They don't necessarily need all the same ones that we do. So, for instance, um, they might, we need to synthesize vitamin D, we need to, to eat vitamin C. It's not entirely clear that apes have to do the same thing. So gorillas versus chimpanzees and bonobos have very different diets. Gorillas live in very deep forests and they eat a lot of leafy vegetables and also the tubers of some water plants. But they have a very different anatomy from us. They have enormous guts. So the food takes a long time to pass through their gut, and there are a lot of bacteria in that gut to break down some of that food and digest the fiber. We don't have those guts, which is one of the big changes that happened to us. Um, chimpanzees and bonobos have a much bigger gut than we do. It's not as big as a gorilla. Um, they specialize as fruit eaters, and these fruits are not like eating apples or pe ripe peaches. A lot of these fruits have very bitter or sour skins, and they may have a tough rind they have to get through, but they, they prefer to eat fruit when they can get it. They eat insects, and I've starred all the things that a chimpanzee needs a tool to get to actually acquire. So there's a chimpanzee in the lower middle picture, which has um, sh sort of stripped the bark off a stick and is sticking the stick into a termite nest, and the termites um, not surprisingly view it as a threat, so they all glom onto it, and then the chimpanzee pulls it out and eats the termites one by one. Yum, yum. Um, nuts are important to some chimpanzees, but not others, so there's a lot of variability, which isn't based on where there are nuts, but where they've learned to use the tools to crack the nuts open. Um, the meat of animals that are smaller than they are. So chimpanzees hunt. They actually organize themselves, so one male goes, chases the monkeys in the tree, and two other males go up ahead and ambush them as they run away from the first male. It's very clever. Um, and then, because the monkeys are small, they don't need tools to get into the dead monkey and eat it. They just rip it apart. They also hunt small antelopes, dikers, and things like that. Um, the one thing that chimpanzees do that, that involves hunting with a tool is some chimpanzees have been observed making a sharp stick with their teeth to then probe into holes in trees in the hopes of spearing a bush baby, which is a little tiny primate, and uh, pulling it out and eating it. So they do use tools to get their food, particularly foods that are rather high in calories. Um, but what you don't, there are a lot of things you don't see on here that, that we eat. Um, so how did we get there? There are some things that chimpanzees eat that you don't think of as food, but here is my field school in China having, we went to a fondue restaurant where instead of just uh, steak and you know bits of meat and apples and things, there were plates of scorpions and plates of ants, all of whom were alive when they were put on the table. So um, everybody was, we had our picture of us taken with, at this restaurant, all of us eating scorpions. And you can see the, not everybody is really happy to be doing this. <laughs> anyway. um, also, when I worked in Botswana, um, if you went to a cocktail party at anybody's house, and there was a plate of what looked like black potato chips that were a little bit thick, but they were flattened fried mapani caterpillars. And that's the national snack. So that was another kind of insect eating opportunity. So there are lots of people around the world that eat insects. They don't happen to be a deliberate part of the human diet, let's say. Um, but elsewhere, there are people who do the same thing that chimps do. OK, so what's different about us, and when did it happen? Well, first of all, we're dependent on tools. It'd be very hard for us to fulfill our dietary needs if we had no tools at all. If we couldn't make anything, how do we get below the ground to dig up a potato? Or how do we get um, open a nut or do some of this? We need tools. So tools were really critical. Um, and the question is, what were the first tools used for? 
So what we see on these first tools, and this is particularly evident in the pictures on the right, is that in the sites with the first tools, we find bones with cut marks on them, like the ones, I don't know if this, like these cut marks here. These are the marks of a stone tool that's been used to scrape the meat off this bone. And then this bone, and, this, and here's a close-up of it, has been smashed, here's an impact fracture, with a stone to break it open and get to the fatty marrow inside. In fact, what people may have been after in this meat is not the protein at all, it's the fat. And what we see is a lot of use of these stones to break open um, big bones with marrow cavities and also bra uh, the brain case, because the brain is about 60% fat of any animal. So fat is something that's kind of bred into us to love. And unfortunately, we now have absolutely infinite amounts of fat available to us on every corner, and uh, it's getting us into trouble. Um, but in the old days, it was very scarce. It was very hard to get to one of these animals. If you um, came across a carcass that had big enough bones that it, you could have marrow cavities in it, the likelihood that a hyena or a lion would have found it first was kind of high. So you're likely to have to put up a big fight to get to the bone. Um, OK, also, the other thing they could do with these tools is make sharpened sticks to dig up tubers from underground. It's something else that chimpanzees and gorillas don't do. But humans are, from a very early time in our history, we are tuber eaters. And initially, when we spread out of Africa two million years ago, we only went to places where tubers could grow, because tubers don't like to grow if the ground is frozen for three quarters of the year, unless they're potatoes, which I'll come to towards the end. Um, so even all over the world, we find that these tools are used to butcher large animals. Whether they actually killed the large animals or whether they just scared the hyenas off the large animals, um, they are, this is a site in, Ch in North China about 1.6 million years ago, where um, all of these things are elephant ribs. And then these other things with white on them are stone tools. So here's a site where stone tools are being used to cut up an elephant and butcher it. Um, but what kind of plants were they eating? How do we figure this out? And this is something that I've been working on with my students. There are a number of things we can look at to try to figure out what the plant foods were. One is we can look at um, some isotopes in our bones. And I'm happy to go into this. Um, in more detail, if somebody has a question about it, maybe later or on email or whatever. Um, but the um, arid zone plants, um, that is when, when there are different atomic weights of both carbon and nitrogen. And the heavy ones, most carbon is 12. That When you breathe in carbon dioxide, most or when a plant breathes in carbon dioxide, um, most of the carbon is 12 atomic weight, but some of it is 13, and some of it is 14, but that little tiny bit that's 14 is radioactive and it decays, so we don't have to worry about it, but the 13 is stable. Similarly with nitrogen, most of it is nitrogen atomic weight 14, but some of it is 15. Now all of these heavy isotopes don't go through metabolic processes as quickly as the lighter ones. So we end up with the heavy ones being discriminated against. Um, normally, carbon, the discrimination is represented as a minus. So carbon is discriminated minus 24 to 28 or so if you're eating a normal plant. But if you're eating a tropical grass like corn or sorghum, where the grass is in an arid zone and it has to conserve its water, it doesn't discriminate quite as much against the heavy isotope of carbon. So you end up with a um, different signature of carbon in the, in the bone, which you can tell in a chemistry lab, um, than you have if you're eating, let's say, um, wheat or barley or some kind of a plant food that grows on a tree. Um, so that's one way we can look at diet. And also, um, nitrogen is increasingly concentrated. The heavy isotope of nitrogen is increasingly concentrated the higher you eat on the food chain. 
So if you're a polar bear, you're very high in nitrogen. If you are a deer, you're very low in nitrogen, in this, ni in this uh, isotope of nitrogen anyway. So that tells us how much meat you're eating or how much protein you're taking in. We can also look at the wear on your teeth, um, not only the shape of your teeth, but also the scratches on it to see if you were eating tough plant foods that left a lot of pits on your teeth or leafy kinds of plants that leave these striations. But what we discovered in uh, working with my student is that if you don't go to a dentist, you know that stuff that builds up on your, your teeth, the calculus that a dental assistant will, or hygienist scrapes off, hopefully, if you're still going to a dentist, which I hope you all are, I highly recommend it. Um, well, that stuff that, that she or he scrapes off your teeth, it turns out it contains starch grains from the food, microscopic grains of starch from all the foods you ate. And if you don't go to a dentist, that stuff stays on your teeth. And it's still there 150,000 years later. And it still has the starch grains in it 150,000 years later. So um, working with Smithsonian paleobotanist Dolores Piperno, we have been able to identify starch grains on the teeth of fossils. And that, tell, that tells us something, because each starch grain is slightly different from every other species. That is, we can tell if something's a grain, if something's a bean, if something's an underground tuber. And we can sometimes tell whether the grain is barley or wheat or something else. Um, we're able to get a fairly good idea of what they were eating. Sometimes we eat things like um, leaves and stems or things with crunchy skins that also have little silica grains in them that form in the, they're, they're called phytoliths, which in Greek means a plant stone. They're little tiny grains of, of silica, and each plant has a different array. Each species has a different kind of these little grains, different shapes. So we're able to say also that some of these fossils, we, we don't eat a lot of things that have um, we don't eat a lot of leaves, we don't eat a lot of stems, and we don't eat a lot of uh, things with very crackly <laughs> skins on the outside. But we're able to say, for instance, that some fossils who lived 50,000 years ago were eating dates because we have the phytoliths that are specific to dates on their teeth. OK, so this is how we try to figure out what the plants were. And how can we say then, what was different about the diets if we try to apply these things to the very earliest members of our genus, our genus Homo, about two million years ago? What was different about their diets? Well, first of all, we know from the bones that they were doing large animal butchery with stone tools. They were killing or eating things that were bigger than they were, and they were breaking open the bones for the fatty portions. It's chimp, don't do that. We also know they were using underground storage organs, tubers and um, other things that grow below the surface and are this energy storage for the plant. Um, we also think that they were eating um, or at least using more carbohydrates. Um, the, and the mystery of this time is that the brain is increasing in size, but where does the extra energy to grow a bigger brain come from? Brains are very expensive. Our brain consumes 20 to 30% of our body's metabolic energy. And two million years ago, it was only one third as big, or half as big. Um, how did it get to be twice as big? Something else had to get smaller. Something that a chimpanzee has had to get smaller. Well, you can't live very well with a smaller heart, or smaller lungs, or a smaller liver, but if you change your diet, you can live with a smaller gut. So what we think got smaller was the gut. But the downside of this is it means it's much harder. You could not go and live on a chimpanzee's diet because you would not get enough food energy. You, don't, you do not have a long enough gut to do that kind of microbial digestion that a is happening in a chimpanzee's gut. So what's the evidence for this also? And I'll show you in a minute. Um, but we think that may be part of where the extra energy came from. But we also think that some of it might have to do with the first efforts at cooking. And if you read the Carmody and Rangham paper, you know that there are elegant experiments with snakes where they're feeding cooked mice or raw mice to snakes, shows us that 
the energy you need to digest your food is much less if the food is cooked. So you eat the food, it has more available energy and you use less energy digesting it, so more of the calories end up feeding your brain than you would have if you ate a raw mouse, if you had the misfortune to eat a raw mouse. Okay, so um, is there any evidence for this cooking stuff? Um, another thing I should mention that differentiates us from chimpanzees is that we all benefit from an enzyme. Starch is broken down by an enzyme called amylase. It's a digestive enzyme. Um, it digests starch. It's present in saliva in one form, and it's also secreted by your pancreas. And this breaks down starch into sugars. So if you eat a starchy food, it can taste sweet to you because in your mouth, the saliva is breaking down the starch into sugar. So you actually begin to taste it as if it's sweet. Um, and another thing, amylase also breaks down starch to make bread, and it breaks down starch to make beer. So it's a very important enzyme in our lives, and we'll talk about beer in a minute. Um, What's interesting about us is we have six to eight times more salivary amylase, more amylase in our mouths than chimpanzees do. And we actually have more copies of the gene that makes it. So we are adapted. It's very hard because we don't have the genetics or the mouth chemistry of people who lived two million years ago. But we are able to see that, say that we have that difference from chimpanzees. And somewhere in our history, we, we acquired that difference, that increased ability to digest starch that chimpanzees don't have. They couldn't live on our diet, just as we couldn't live on, their, on theirs. So one of the things we see happening is that the body size, here is Lucy, who's three million years old about. And look at how big her abdomen is compared to the rest of her. Um, it's really very large. The hips are very wide to in, uh, sort of encapsulate that, that abdomen. And here is. Um, a teenager from 1.5 million years ago with a much smaller, he's much taller than Lucy, but his abdomen is much shorter than Lucy's is. So this is evidence for the gut being smaller. Um, we also have more body fat than chimpanzees do, especially young, when we're young. Um, and this may also be a reflection of our metabolism, our increased ability to digest and use these starches, these carbohydrates. Um, so look, it's a combination. It's a diet that's higher in protein, it's higher in fat, and it's um, better at digesting carbohydrates than a chimpanzee. Um, so cooking, what does cooking do for us? This is a, in, a, in a word, besides tasting good. Um, it partially digests protein and carbs and increases the availability of carbohydrates. So some things you really couldn't eat unless you cooked them. Um, try eating a raw potato sometime. It's not, not too great. Um, and it allows us to eat lots of things that, that really are somewhat toxic if you don't cook them. Some grains, some beans, some other foods. Um, as it destroys some toxins, it also, as we know, destroys some nutrients. But destroying the toxins at least allows us to get some energy out of the food. And as Carmody and Rangham show, it reduces the metabolic energy that you need to digest it. It allows you to have a smaller gut, more fat storage, a larger brain. And with this smaller gut, and this is one of my take home messages, we cannot maintain our body weight on raw plant foods only. We simply have lost the ability to do that. We cannot live on a chimpanzee diet. If you go on a, yes, all of these diets, are great if you need to lose weight. But once you lose the weight, if you stay on this diet, you could end up in big trouble. Um, you could end up essentially developing a condition similar to anorexia. Um, so what's the evidence? Is there any evidence that act actual evidence that people were cooking anything? We look for, um, because cooking heats up the ground and changes the magnetism of the area under the fire, we look for small, localized, reddish, or oxidized, magnetically altered patches of ground. And there are a couple of places where we have this ground at about a million and a half. Not everybody accepts them. 
Um, I had a student who was part of my project in the Congo who went around trying to look at what, those, what fire would do to the ground, and he was burning down the landscape right and left, and discovered that tree stumps don't burn very well, and so these round patches, would be, it would be hard for them to be tree stumps. They were probably fires. We, don't, we can't absolutely say that. We also have a site in South Africa that has burned bones, um, which were burned at a higher enough temperature. One of the things that humans do when they're keeping a fire is they keep feeding it. They keep sticking the logs further and further into the fire. So they keep the temperature up. And the, those fires reach a much higher temperature than a natural fire does. A natural fire can be very hot, but when it's really hot, it tends to consume all its fuel quickly and move on. So you can get killed by this very hot fire, wave of fire advance, but the fire is fast moving because it consumes its fuel. What humans do is they keep feeding the fire. So the temperature gets hot and stays hot in one place. That's the difference. The burned bones seem to suggest that, but they fell into the cave from the surface. Was the fire on the surface? What, did, was it a human fire or a bush fire? That the jury is out. So it's a little hard to absolutely say they had cooking at 1.5, and we have the archaeological evidence, but we have the gut evidence that suggests that something was going on. Um, this is the oldest site where we really have hearts and we can say absolutely these guys are cooking nuts and seeds and um, maybe their bedding too is catching on fire because there are burned grass seeds there. Um, but we have lots of evidence at this site which is about 800,000 years old from the Golan Heights that people were cooking by 800,000. Um, moving forward to Neanderthals, there's an argument because Neanderthals have very high nitrogen signature in their bones that they were pure carnivores. The problem with this, we like to think that Inuits or Eskimos are pure carnivores too, that they live on what else could they have? There's no plants up there most of the year. Um, the problem is that wild, if you live on wild animals, their meat is really lean. We're used to eating meat that has a lot of fat. Maybe 30% of a cow is fat. Less than 5% of a wild animal is fat. This is why a bison burger is better for you than a hamburger, um, at least until it gets really domesticated and then it shoots up in terms of its fat content. Um, and it turns out that you're not getting much fat if you eat a wild animal, unless it's a whale or a, a marine mammal has a lot of fat on it. And if you eat more than 40 to 50% of your di daily diet in protein, it effectively causes you to starve. That is, your protein takes energy to digest. You cannot, unless you prime your cells to digest that protein by eating carbs and fat, you cannot generate enough energy to digest that protein properly. So um, your body rejects the protein. You go into... Um, you uh, begin to lose calcium and nutrients and lean tissue, that is, you lose weight, not just fat, but also weight. Um, your metabolic rate goes way up from trying to digest this protein. And you go into a condition we can call ketosis, which is also happens to diabetics, with ammonia in your blood. Um, this is a diet that was promoted about 20 years ago by um, a doctor as the Scarsdale diet as a way to lose weight. You just eat protein and you don't eat carbohydrates and you lose a lot of weight. Um, the problem is that also you lose weight because you can't maintain your body weight on a pure protein diet. And it was known that Native Americans who came to the end of winter and were basically living on rabbits because there were no plants flourishing then, often they experienced something called rabbit starvation. They had plenty of food. They had plenty of things putting in their mouths, but they were always hungry because you can't digest. The food goes in one end and out the other. You can't digest it if you don't also eat carbs and fat. So you need to balance your protein intake, including vegetable protein, with fat or carbs. So Neanderthals could not have been pure carnivores, and we showed from their teeth that they weren't. Um, this is the paper you read by um, my student Amanda Henry and Dolores and me, um, that Neanderthals lived from 180,000 to 30,000 years ago in Europe and Western Asia. 
and they ate plants throughout their range. They ate aquatic plant tubers in Belgium, they ate dates in Iraq, they ate legumes and grains, that is beans and grains everywhere. They even cooked, the, the bar we can tell that the starch grains were cooked in water from Iraq and it looks like barley, so they were eating barley porridge. Now the great mystery is, what do, how do you make barley porridge if you don't have a pot? Because they didn't, it didn't look as if they had a pot, but my colleagues assure me that it's perfectly possible to make barley porridge in a skin or even in a bark container. You just put, throw in stones and heat it up and then you fish out the stones and eat the porridge. You throw in hot stones till it gets hot and then you fish out the stones and eat the porridge. So this was based on the study of starch grains preserved in the dental calculus of Neanderthals and early modern humans. So what was the real Paleolithic diet all about? We think it had very limited meat, all of it very lean. So we have an inborn need for fat or hunger for fat. When I, I worked in the Kalahari with hunters and gatherers over a period of 16 years, and if you asked one of them what kind of, you know, all my students were dreaming about dominoes and um, ice cream and stuff. If I asked one of them what they dreamed about, they said, I dream about eating fat. I dream about eating a wonderful animal that's so fat that the fat runs down my chin and I get diarrhea. <laughs> Remember this? <laughs> not, not quite my dream. But um, that was the, the greatest desire that, that people had was for fat because they hardly had any. They also have limited amounts of sugar. So if you're a guy, and this is another area where I worked in Tanzania, if you're a Hadza hunter-gatherer and you're coming home and you haven't managed to kill anything and your family's sitting there hungry, the best substitute for a, a dead animal is a honeycomb. So that's the alternative. That's a rare treat. It's very highly valued. Um, people ate insects in the Paleolithic, and they ate cooked beans and legumes, grains, tubers, lots of fiber in their diet, but less than chimps or gorillas. They ate some leafy greens, because we occasionally have the phytoliths. They ate fruit whenever they could, because basically we're frugivores, like chimpanzees, if we can get it. And they ate nuts where they were available, which are, can be very high in fat and protein. Um, especially after 100,000 years ago, they ate fish and shellfish. And the advantage of that is the kinds of omega-3 fatty acids in fish also help to grow a healthy brain. So um, part of the, what's going on in the last 100,000 years is a lot of cognitive development and a lot of eating fish and shellfish. It's very interesting. They didn't have a lot of access to eggs because they weren't any chickens. But occasionally, they would steal eggs from a nest. And if it was an ostrich egg, they could have a big party because an ostrich egg will make an omelet that feeds about 20 people. Um, milk was only human. It was only for babies. There were no dairy products at all. So how many people here had dairy products in the last two days? Ice cream, OK. So we're practically 100% um, dairy product uh, class, but you couldn't have eaten dairy products if you lived in the Paleolithic. And there's lots of variety. There are more than 100 plant foods used by the Xinhua Sea of the Kalahari. Um, and as I said, whoops, I went back. OK. So large animals are rare. This is my, my guys in the Kalahari. Um, they would set snares for birds and eat their eggs as well. They'd roll one egg out of the nest and wait for the set a snare. So when the mother bird came back and tried to roll the egg back in, she'd get caught, and so would the eggs. But most of their kills are small. This is a baby antelope that ended up in a pot and was stored by the mother in a tree. Um, a big animal, but rare. And most of these animals are quite small. Um, and they're very, very lean. Um, the plant foods, this was just somebody coming home at the end of the day, and we asked her to just spread out what she'd managed to take. So even here, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12, a dozen different kinds of plants that um, these people are getting. Um, berries, nuts, and here are children gathering surface tubers and other people getting deeper tubers. Um, honey is another thing that men will, it's mostly men, um, will go after as a prestige item to bring home. And they smoke out the bees and uh, t 
tend to, to uh, ignore the stings. Um, OK, so I'd like to talk for five minutes or so about what happened at the end of the Paleolithic and the agricultural revolution. Um, that it actually begins bef well before 10,000 years ago with keeping wild animals. That is, taking goats to places where they don't live naturally, or sheep, um, and hoarding grains in storage pits. The first domestic animal, of course, is a dog, and then goats and sheep, and then cows, chickens, pigs, donkeys, camels, cats, etc. It changes the landscape. Agriculture changes the landscape. It makes generalized, diverse environments into specialized one-crop environments. There are many fewer plant and animal species on the landscape once the agriculturalists arrive. They cut down the trees to make fences or to make open country. They settle in permanent villages and build storage structures. So it's a very different landscape than when people are roaming over the landscape just picking food off as it's available. There are negative effects on humans, as you saw from that chapter in the Our Origins textbook. Humans living together for long periods of time have more diseases. Their food is less nutritious because there's more reliance on starchy plants and fewer of them. So you're more likely to have vitamin deficiencies if you just eat one or two kinds of plants. Um, so there are vitamin, protein, and iron deficiencies. People are smaller once agriculture comes in. And they fight a lot Oops, sorry. over land and resources. Domesticated foods often have more fat and less fiber. Domestication also increased the consumption of psychoactive substances. Um, so we have alcohol. In fact, there was an argument that agriculture had nothing to do with bread or porridge to start with and everything to do with beer, um, because we know that beer making is very ancient. Um, coffee and tea and cocoa, cocoa's the new world one, coffee and tea are old world, are also psychoactive substances, as you all know, to keep you awake. Um, tat, which is a narcotic leaf that's chewed in Africa and the Near East, um, cannabis or marijuana, tobacco in the new world, all of these contain um, alkaloid chemicals that change our um, physiology in some way. And certainly, those became more available with domestication because people were growing them. Um, but the positive effect on humans, if you wonder why do it if it has so many bad effects, is you're less likely to starve if you can store food against the hard times, if you can store food for the winter or the dry season. The people I lived with who were hunter-gatherers lost 10% of their body weight every year in August and September because there simply wasn't enough food. If you're an agriculturalist, you have enough food because you've stored it for the winter. Although I always thought, I have to say, I lived on a farm in France for four years. And every year in February, the food got very thin. I always thought Lent was invented out of necessity. <laughs> um, so um, food, there's also less work for women. Women have to, don't have to, they may do all the hoeing and the weeding and all that stuff. But they don't have to walk 15 or 20 kilometers a day carrying their weight in children and food. They can leave the children at home because there's animal milk to wean the children on. They can walk a short distance to the field and work and then go home. So we found in an actual experiment in the Kalahari that women get fatter and they have more kids if they are farming than they do if they're hunting and gathering. Um, so you have more babies born, and animal milk su supplements human milk, so you have more babies surviving. So the population grows. Um, and these are the major places where farming began, though I think this picture understates Africa a little bit. Um, in the New World, you had maize, beans, cocoa, and chili peppers. Chili peppers is an interesting thing, because most people think that peppers were worldwide, that not black peppers, but red hot peppers. But they weren't. We didn't have any peppers in the Old World until Columbus. Um, and tomatoes is another thing we didn't have in the Old World until Columbus. Then squash, potatoes, lima beans, chili peppers, et cetera. In, and there were even some domesticated foods in North America. The green squashes um, that we eat in the winter were domesticated in North America, as were sunflowers and some other plants. In the old world, we had the major foods of wheat, barley, chickpeas, dates, peas, pistachios, and also cows, goats, and sheep in the Near East, 
and cows in North Africa, millet, sorghum, yams, and coffee in Africa, rice in China, and a whole lot of vegetables in Europe. Um, and I had, whoops, what happened? Oh, what is, okay, what's domestication? Um, we inadvertently domesticated house flies and rats, uh, but we don't use them for a purpose, they just live with us. Um, a domesticated animal, you have to ensure its survival, that it loses its natural defenses. We control its reproduction, so it may lose the ability to reproduce itself. And we find these animals and plants changing their habitats, their ranges, different ripening seasons, and so forth, and becoming more docile. So animals become smaller and more docile than their wild relatives. There are lots of breeds and color differences, and plants become larger or more easily collected. Why did we do it? We wanted to increase the predictability of getting these things. It increases the productive potential of an acre of land, and it's a way of coping with climate deterioration or crowding. Sometimes called a broad spectrum revolution, except to me it's a narrow spectrum revolution. So um, here is a pic, uh, rock painting from the, the northern Sahara showing a herd of domesticated cattle maybe five, 6,000 years ago in Africa. And you can tell they're domesticated because they're all different colors. If they were wild, they'd all be the same color. Um, so some animals get domesticated over others because they're herbivores, because they're large, they a big return for the investments, because they grow quickly, because it's easy to make them breed in captivity, they aren't nasty or they don't run away if you come up to them, and they're not so territorial. They can be moved to wherever food and water is available. Um, and they have a dominance hierarchy, so they all follow the head animal. You don't want them all running off in different directions. We once had a, owned a herd of sheep. The anthropology department had a herd of sheep over the medical school because we were interested in um, what happens to legs when you run on a treadmill. And the way we got the sheep to run on a treadmill was to put a mirror, set of mirrors around it so it was following its own butt but it thought it was following the butt of the sheep in front. So it just kept running and running and trying to catch up with itself. <laughs> Never happened. Okay, so sometimes they tried to domesticate the wrong thing and it didn't work. So this is another rock painting of a herd of giraffes that are all tethered and haltered, but we never successfully domesticated giraffes, even though we obviously tried once. Um, cows were domesticated both in Africa and in Europe and then they were crossbred with Indian cows, and they're the basis of most African and European pastoralist societies because they have such a big reward for the labor. And they store food on the hoof. Um, people usually drink milk from cows. In, in parts of Africa, they also eat blood from cows, but they rarely will kill a cow for meat unless it's a young male cow or an old female cow. So what happens to health when they emphasize domesticated food sources? There's a general health decline, less diverse diet, there's weaker bones, shorter stature, poor dental health, cavities, anemia, malnutrition lines, and also you're living in one place for long periods of time. So there's a lot of potential to have disease, there's a lot of dead animal parts lying around, lots of human waste, and so you have the spread of communicable diseases that you didn't have when you were living at low densities and moving around a lot. And also the spread of diseases that jump from animals to humans. And I had smallpox on here, but it's recently been discovered that smallpox actually jump to cows from humans rather than to humans from cows. So new, new news in the last week. Okay, two, I have two more points really quickly. The urban revolution, how did this affect diets? Lots of people stopped producing their own food. They were leaders, priests, specialists. They made pots, they made metals, they didn't grow their own food. And in the early Near East cities, the leaders ate steaks, and the farmers had what was left. And you can see this from the bones that get left. The, the feet end up in the farmer's um, waste piles, and the, steak, the rib bones end up in the, lead, in, the, in the priest and the chiefs and the, the pharaoh and whatever in his kitchen. Um, there are also massive irrigation works around these cities that brought farming to dry areas, tried to increase the amount of land you could grow things on, but the irrigation degraded the land. 
And the urban revolution also led to a whole group of specialized pastoralists living outside the cities that were trading into the, their animals into the cities in exchange for grain. These, this, these, between the first settlements and the first cities, there, which is about 3,000 years, there was a six-fold increase in the population of farmed areas over what it had been before. Um, this development of cities also led to the transport of food. Initially, they only transported high-value storable items by ship, wine, olive oil, salted fish. But it led to warfare and conquest to control shipping and routes and sources. And the, one of the best examples are the Punic Wars of ancient Rome, where they, they fought to conquer the breadbasket of North Africa so they could grow more wheat to feed the growing cities of Italy. And a lot of colonial endeavors were just about that, about not being able to feed the people at home so you go out and conquer somebody else so you can use their land to feed the home front. OK, so before 1492, these voyages moved some food around. So chickens came to Europe and Africa. Sugarcane and bananas came to Africa from South and East Asia. Pigs came from Asia to the Near East, Europe, and North Africa. From Africa, did Africa give us anything? Well, it gave us cats. It gave us coffee. And probably some other things that we eat that came from Africa. And there's even something that seems to have come from South America before Columbus, but it didn't get very far. The sweet potato might have gotten into the Pacific from people moving from the coast of South America into the Pacific Ocean. So this is the, I gave you this, I'm just going to flash this by because it's in your reading, but you can see all the things, all the plant foods that are absolutely central to our diet today that started out in the New World. And then there are all these other foods, particularly the animals, the cattle, sheep, pigs, and horses, that started out in the old world and ended up in the new world after 1492. So there aren't an enormous number of plant foods. There's olives, there's coffee beans, there's some fruits, um, there's sugar cane and bananas and things like that that move from the old world to the new. The biggest part of the story was animals. In the, in the New World, the only domestic animals when Columbus arrived were llamas and alpacas and guinea pigs. You might not think of a guinea pig as a domesticated food item, but my colleague Kitty Allen worked in per Highland, Peru, and she described to me the first night that she moved into this village and spent the night with the family. And she went to sleep by the fire, and as soon as the, the family went to sleep, all these guinea pigs rushed out of the corners and converged on the fire to eat the scraps. So she was lying there covered in guinea pigs. <laughs> They're all doing, if you've ever owned a guinea pig, it goes squeak, 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 squeak all the time. <laughs> so it's very disconcerting. Anyway, but they were eating the guinea pigs. They weren't like cute pets, so they were part of the food. Um, so there weren't any domestic animals in the New World. There weren't a lot of really high-value plants. In the, there was wheat, there was barley, but a lot of Europe is too far north to grow lots of those things. So in the 30 year, 300 years between Columbus and 1800, the world's population doubled and quadrupled by 1900, another 100. But most of the first 300 years was because there was more, simply more food. And um, part of the more food had to do with the potato. The effect of potato farming in Europe was especially dramatic in the marginal areas. The European daily calories increased 30% by the mid-1700s, and adults were 10 inches high, taller than they had been before. Life expectancy at birth increased to, by almost 50%. Potatoes produce three times more calories per acre than grains, and they have all these vitamins in them that grains don't have so that it's a complete diet. They have vitamin C, even. And a family of, of eight people could live on an acre of land with a potato farm and a milk cow, and that's a complete diet. And what happened? There were too many people to even go on living, so what did they do? They emigrated to America. And um, we had this initial wave of immigration in this country before the potato famine, before the potato failed, that increased. It, it, they crowded into the cities of Europe, and they emigrated to the New World. Um, the problem of dependence on one crop is, of course, that it can fail. It can get a disease, which is what happened in 1848. Um, in Africa, you had cassava, maize, and sweet potatoes, which are all New World plants, having a similar effect. 
And it's argued that that helped fuel the slave trade, that the slave trade perhaps could not have continued in the massive amounts that it had without those extra food sources creating an excess of population. Because whenever you have an excess of population, you tend to have people fighting over land. So the take home message of this lecture then is that we are especially adapted to eat fiber and a variety of plant foods, not too much fiber, but, but um, a lot more fiber than most of us are eating. Um, the less processing, the better, but cooking is good for you. It um, makes the, the uh, food more available in terms of providing calories. That we shouldn't go for raw food and high protein diets. They're not good for you, and they lead to weight loss for a reason. We're also adapted to prefer fat and sugar because they were rare high energy foods in our past. We can't overindulge in them, and also salt was rare in our natural diet. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me um, just go. I'm gonna our go next with this. speaker is Alice Camps, and Alice is a curator at the National Archives, and we're very lucky to have her. This is the second time she's going to be giving a presentation in this class. So um, Alice has worked on a number of food-related exhibits, including the uh, What's Cooking Uncle Sam exhibit that was um, put on by the National Archives a couple of years ago. I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was an excellent exhibit. And Jose was actually a consultant for that project. So. I think we are all set here for you. So, how many of you are aware of the effects that the federal government has on the foods that you eat? Can anybody name a way that the government's involved in what you eat? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do nutritional guides and recommend um, diet for people, right? What else? Yes? Through what? Yes, labeling. They regulate the labeling of foods. Uh huh. Exactly right. Yes, they subsidize the production of certain agricultural products. Anything else? One more. Good. Right. The FDA approves certain products. Um, so clearly, you're aware of some of the ways that the federal government is involved in what we eat. But why? How did the government get into the business of regulating what we eat and making these recommendations um, and all these other things? There's nothing in the Declaration of Independence about life, liberty, and the pursuit of a perfect diet. And the word food does not in occur in the Constitution. So a few years ago, when I started doing research for this exhibit, I tried to answer that question. Um, I have to say that. Uh, when I first started out, this was my first assignment at the National Archives. I'd come here from Chicago, where I had done uh, exhibits as an exhibit developer for places like Shedd Aquarium. And I have to say, I was a little nervous about creating an exhibit about archival documents. Because if you've got a Komodo dragon in your exhibit, you kind of have a leg up on engaging your audience. <laughs> so I was a little bit nervous, but I was really excited about this subject, because who's not fascinated by food, right? You guys all signed up for this class, didn't you? <laughs> well, when I started my research, I realized that I had nothing to worry about. There's a lot of fascinating stuff in the National Archives. Has anybody done research there? Not yet. I hope you will someday. Um, there are amazing stories, too, if you, if, you, if you dig down. And I'm going to share with you a few of the stories that I uncovered doing research for this exhibit. But first, let me just back up and explain what the National Archives is, in case you're a little fuzzy on, on that. And if you are, don't feel bad. We are constantly explaining to our visitors, even our own parents, that we are not the Library of Congress. We're not the Smithsonian. We are the federal agency that, that maintains um, the, the, what we call the permanently valuable records of the three branches of the federal government. Um, and as I was to discover, the breadth and scope of those records is it's really astonishing. They estimate there are now about 10 billion pages of text in our custody. Um, but in addition to that, it's not just paper. There are archival films, photographs, charts, maps, posters, um, almost anything you can imagine. Uh, I don't think anyone's come across a Komodo dragon yet, but if they do, I won't be entirely surprised. Um, so that is the National Archives. We like to say that we hold what we like to call the essential evidence of 
the rights of American citizens, the actions of federal officials, and the national experience. So I'd like to start by showing you three pieces of evidence that I came across early on in my research. And then we'll talk about each one of those. This is a notebook that was kept by somebody who had a job called Food Adulteration Inspector. This I thought was a kind of creepy photograph of a guy reading a book in what looks like some kind of cell. And this little package of radish seeds is the third. So when I found these items, I had no idea what they were evidence of. Um, it took some time to put the pieces together, but when I did, I realized that they represented three fascinating stories about the evolution of how the government became involved in what we eat. Um, each of these stories took place at the turn of the 20th century. Each of them involves what I like to call a food crusader, someone who was uniquely passionate about and dedicated to improving what Americans eat. And each of them was part of a revolution in how Americans produce, perceive, and protect their foods. So let's start with this seed packet. Um, without any context for this item, what can you tell just by looking at it? Anybody? What kind of evidence does it, what does it give us? What clues does it give us? Mm -hmm. It has the word congressional seed distribution, so maybe Congress or the government is passing out seeds to promote farming. Yes, you're exactly right. Did you know that the government used to give out free seeds to farmers? I don't personally usually think of the government sending free stuff in the mail at all, so <laughs> I was kind of surprised by this. But um, in 1862, the newly established Department of Agriculture began to aid farmers by mailing them free seeds for rare and unusual plants. Um, and let me just go back to that seed. And do you, can you read the bottom line? It says, please report the result of your trial to this department. So they asked farmers to write to them to tell them, you know, how did these new plants do in their, uh, uh, on their farms? Um, but this was not even the first time that the government had started to collect and distribute foreign seeds. Uh, the very first agricultural appropriation, before there even was a Department of Agriculture, was $1,000 to collect and distribute seeds through the Patent Office. Apparently, collecting foreign seeds and trying them in American gardens has a long history in this country. Does anybody recognize this building? Yes, it's Monticello, that's right. Um, both Je uh, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, among others, collected seeds on their foreign diplomatic missions abroad and brought them home and tested them in their gardens. And um, Thomas Jefferson, in, in fact, even risked his life smuggling rice out of Lombardy, Italy in 1787. It was a crime punishable by death because they were very proud of their risotto. <laughs> Um, but this was not just a hobby for him. This was, this was a serious thing. When he asked himself at the end of his life whether his country was better for his having lived at all, he wrote a short list of 10 of what he considered his major accomplishments. Of course, we have the Declaration of Independence. That made the list. That whole freedom of religion thing, that was pretty good. And then the introduction of European, European olive trees and rice. This was a big, this was very important to him. Um, he is sometimes quoted as having said that the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. We're gonna meet another individual who felt kind of the same way. Okay, so do you think this was a popular program with farmers? Free stuff, right? What's not to like? It was so popular, in fact, that at the height of its popularity, in around 1897, they distributed 1.1 billion packets of seeds to farmers. Um, this is a picture of the, there was an entire building dedicated to this. This is a packeting floor of the seed distribution building here in Washington, D.C. from 1905. Um, but the commercial seed industry was not too happy about it. Um, it was growing and it 
began to lobby um, against this program and, and putting more and more pressure on government to abolish it, which they eventually did in uh, 1924. But what I found even more interesting than the seed distribution program was the foreign plant exploration program, which was uh, an activity within the Bureau of, of Plant Industry in the Department of Agriculture. And it sent um, adventurous botanists all over the world to collect foreign seeds and plants to bring back to this country. And they used genetic, genetic material from those plants to create strains of crops that were resistant to diseases and that could withstand various climates and soils. Um, and some of these plants that they brought back became the basis for entire industries. This is a photograph of President Theodore Roosevelt. He's the one holding the shovel. And he is ceremoniously replanting one of two Brazilian orange trees that became the basis for the entire naval orange industry in California. Another important um, introduction was hard red, or sometimes called winter wheat. Uh, Mark Carlton, who worked for the Department of Agriculture, uh, had observed that the Russian Mennonite farmers in Kansas had brought seeds um, over to this country, and their wheat was able to withstand drought and a disease that was plaguing uh, wheat farmers in the Central Plains. But here we have my favorite plant explorer. And I never really thought I was going to have a favorite plant explorer, but <laughs> now I do. This is Frank N. Meyer. Um, he traveled on several expeditions for the Department of Agriculture. He brought back over 2,500 different types of plants, including 108 soybean varieties. Um, you may have heard of him because he has a fruit named after him. Meyer lemon, that's right. This is Meyer, Frank Meyer of, the, of Meyer lemon fame. <laughs> um, let's see. He was born in Holland, but adopted the United States as his own country, and was recruited by the Bureau of Plant Industry for his knowledge of plants, but also for his willingness to walk long distances. And if you look at this map, you'll begin to understand why that wasn't a trivial characteristic for the job. Do you see black, the black dots on, on the map? He traveled to each of those places and collected plants there. And he covered almost all of that ground entirely on foot. Um, but walking lost long, distance, long distances wasn't, weren't the only hardships that he faced. This is a quote from an article that was written about him. He tussled with robber brigands, wolf packs, revolutionary soldiers on the prowl, uh, interpreters who refused to go on, carts that shattered on lonely mountainsides, inadequate food, poor shelter, and in vermin that infested Asian villages. I'm really fascinated by, by this guy because he was just so dedicated to this cause. I mean, he, he really had a calling to do this and felt that, that, like Jefferson, this was one of the most important contributions that he could make to this country. And it's certainly not something we think about much anymore. Um, fortunately for us, he took reams of photographs on his fascinating expeditions. And I'd like to show you a few, because I just love looking at this. Here's a very healthy looking kohlrabi. Um, but he didn't photograph just the, the plants that he collected. Um, he photographed the people that he worked with. Like this is one of his guides. He had terrible time with guides. They would, they would uh, accept money for two weeks, and then they would take off. And he would be left in a, you know, in a foreign place where he didn't know how to get around. Um, does anybody here like Tintin? Doesn't he look like Captain Haddock? <laughs> that beard? I mean, I've never seen that beard on a real person before. Um, anyway, uh, when he was lucky enough to have a place to stay, it was usually something really dreadful where he shared a cement slab with a bunch of strangers and would come out covered, covered with lice. Um, he wrote wonderful notes on the back of all his photographs, like this one, our place of lodging in Chang Li. The exterior gives no idea of the filth inside. Here's a charming little bistro where he stopped for lunch. And this gives you an idea of some of the terrain that he crossed. Some of the terrifying looking bridges. 
and he, he writes that it was, it was extremely windy that day. <laughs> um, and he was traveling in places where there weren't roads, so there was a lot of improvisation going on. He writes here that the mules have landed and the paddlers confer on how to get the cart off of the ferry that had crossed the river. I imagine there was a similar conversation on the other end, but how to get the cart on the ferry. Um, this is a gardener's family. A woman, he, he documented how these foods were used in the local culture. Here's a Korean woman mashing boiled soybeans. And this is something of a traffic jam, I guess, in, <laughs> in China on the famous Marco Polo Bridge. Um, so that is Frank Meyer. Uh, and just like to ask you next time you have a Georgia peach or a Florida orange to remember that, the, uh, that its ancestors may have been brought over by some of these brave plant explorers that worked for the Department of Agriculture. Um, they continue to do plant exploration today and they continue to breed new and improved crops and now it's on a molecular level, far beyond my understanding, but it's a pretty fascinating, must be a fascinating job to have. So let's go back to our little notebook. Um, this was in a box of food adulteration records. Adulteration is not a term that we use much anymore. Does anybody know what it means? It's adding, basically adding foreign substances to food or beverages. Um, so. I didn't really have any context for this when I found it. And I opened this book up, and this is the very first page. And it says, colored candy manufactured by Bunt and Frank Chicago. Note, this sample of candy requires a very careful examination. After eating of it, one child died, and two, became, uh, two others were taken sick. Although it has not yet been shown that the said bad effects proceeded from the candy, it is very strongly suspicious. Any reaction to that? What do you think? I was really, I was stunned. I had no idea that, you know, kids in, in the 1890s could die from eating candy. But apparently, um, this was not a totally rare thing, as this cartoon shows us. Um, this is a cover of Puck, which was a popular magazine at that time, and it shows our mutual friend, this giant stick of candy. There's a doctor and a sexton, who is the person who looks out for the church and the graveyard. And listed on the candy are the different types of things that were routinely added, and it includes arsenic, um, something called verdigris, chalk. Uh, so this was something that happened a, a fair amount of time. And candy, of course, wasn't the only thing that had there's these crazy substances in it. This is another cartoon showing a man who needs a chemistry set to figure out what's in his food. So think about what it was like before there were any regulations on food in this country. There were no lists of ingredients. You had no, no, way, no idea of knowing what you were getting. And this is before the Pure Food and Drug Act. So the, the man who kept that notebook, even if he proved that candy was what killed those children, he could do nothing about it. He was just gathering, gathering evidence. So these are some of the things that you might find in your food uh, at that time. Yum, right? <laughs> well, enter our next food crusader. This is Harvey Wiley. He was chief chemist and then later the first uh, commissioner of the FDA. Many consider him the father of the pure food and drug laws. He was convinced that a lot of these things that were being added to foods were at least unhealthy and at worst um, could, po could possibly kill you. He lobbied for many years, over a decade, to, have, to get the government to have some kind of regulations on food to protect people. Um, he was very, very frustrated and eventually beginning in uh, 1903, he started a, um, an experiment to help gather some proof that these things actually were bad for people. Um, he called this experiment the hygienic table, 
What he did was he asked 12 volunteers uh, to agree to take all of their meals in the Department of Agriculture. And as you can see from this picture, they outfitted this room with white tablecloths, they hired waiters, they hired a professional chef, and they served only really fresh, high quality food. But the catch was they added increasing amounts of chemicals like boric acid and formaldehyde. And then he kept very careful notes on their um, reactions. This is one page of his notes. And here's a description of, of what happened to this subject number five, who was nauseated and sick during the night of February 1st and vomited all of his dinner. He did not eat breakfast on February 2nd and was not given preservative sporic acid. That was kind of him <laughs> on this day. Um, so it's probably no surprise that this group of young men took this as their motto. Um, but I've read that these, these men also really felt like they were doing something good for people by participating in this project. The press, however, thought this was pretty hilarious. And they loved to make fun of what they called the poison squad or the poison brigade. And they wrote little funny things about it like this. Um, Wiley at first was very upset about this. He thought they weren't taking his science serious. He was a serious science scientist and they weren't taking it seriously. But ultimately the notoriety of the experiment and the attention that it got did help pass the pure food, eventually pass the pure food and drug laws. Which made it illegal to ship or receive any misbranded, adulterated or spoiled foods. So the law passes, now we have these inspectors who can actually do something, and they created this film proudly proclaiming what some of the things that they were protecting Americans from. And I'm going to show you a little clip. If you're queasy, you might not want to watch it. <laughs> They're unloading um, imported foods that came into this country from other countries. We added the music. <laughs> so um, I think I'm going to skip the ketchup story, even though it's pretty great. Should I? Yeah. Should I tell the ketchup story? <laughs> All right. I just don't want to go over. Um, so this is a jug of ketchup that was confiscated because it was made of decomposed materials. Ketchup was one of the first commercially successful convenience foods um, beginning in the mid, I think, mid-1800s. Um, and there were many, many different people, tons and tons of people were producing this stuff. And there were many different kinds. There was ketchup made with oysters and mushrooms. It wasn't all tomatoes. But some of the tomato ketchup was made with the refuse from canneries. So there were spoiled tomatoes, peels, cores, all kinds of nasty stuff in it, which caused the ketchup bottles to explode. As this cartoon shows, this woman ducking all the exploding ketchup bottles. So hence, the companies making the ketchup started adding chemicals and pre preservatives to try to keep the ketchup from exploding. Well, then along comes Heinz, which proved, the co uh, this company proved that you could make ketchup without preservatives if you used fresh tomatoes in a clean factory. And not surprisingly, Heinz was one of the few ketchup producers who survived the pure food and drug laws, um, which is why today, when we think of ketchup, you think of this thick red tomatoey stuff and not something made with oysters or mushrooms. Although uh, Jose Andres has, is opening a restaurant called the America Eats Tavern. Have you heard of it? And uh, he has eight different kinds of ketchup there. So if you really want to try some of these extinct ketchups, you, you can do that there. Personally, I thought there was a reason why they don't make them anymore. I didn't think they were great. Um, OK, our weird guy in the cell. And if you read the article that I recommended, you might have figured out where he is. Did anybody? The, policy, the foreign policy of the calorie article? Yeah? Yes, 
He's, uh, Will, this is Wilbur Atwater, whom I think you learned a little bit about. And he was the one who quantified the energy values of different foods, proteins, carbohydrates. And he did that uh, using a respiration calorimeter. There it is. <laughs> so he figured out how much energy people expended doing different activities. And he created um, this, these charts of of, of all these quantified measurements of foods. Um, and this was revolutionary because prior to this, people thought about food in pretty much strictly cultural and subjective terms. This made it scientific. This was kind of the end of eating food because you liked it and the beginning of eating food because it was good for you. They called it scientific eating. Um, here's one of the one of his publications, which eventually led to all kinds of different food guides, nutrition guides. This is the first one the government published. It's called Food for Young Children, originally published in 1911. Um, there were five food groups in this one. Uh, I found this wonderful chart, 100 calorie portions of a few familiar foods, which surprised me because it's from the 1930s. But after I learned about at water, I understood that um, they were encouraging people to economize by only taking in as much energy as they put out, so they could become as efficient as machines, and the whole, you know, the whole country um, could become efficient as well. They also encouraged people to be efficient with their money by saying, "Look, you can eat these cheap cuts of meat. They have just as much protein as the more expensive ones." I don't think that went went very far either. <laughs> they also promoted milk as kind of a superfood. This is just a portion of a film the government produced. Okay, so, the, so World War I comes along, and the government is able to calculate how much food it thinks it's going to need based on energy values for the soldiers, the allies, and citizens. And they decide they're not going to have enough. We're going to have to ask people to conserve. So uh, Atwater's um, notion that foods are basically interchangeable, protein is protein, doesn't matter what kind you eat, really helped at this time because the government could say, here, eat cottage cheese. It's cheaper than meat, and you'll help us conserve food. Um, they also uh, asked people to, to conserve sugar. They had sugarless and wheatless and meatless days. They um, basically uh, Kind of asked, we're kind of promoting the idea that it was your patriotic duty to conserve food. And here's this wonderful old film. I love this early animation. Um, as you know, these nutrition guides continued to evolve. At one time, there were 12 food groups. Um, this is a nutrition guide from World War II. At that time, they'd begun to understand the importance of vitamins in the diet. So here you see three different sections for fruits and vegetables. But I really like this one because butter has its own food group <laughs> on an equal level with the fruits and yellow vegetables and all the other stuff. But also because it says, in addition to the, the basic seven, just eat anything. You know, just anything you want after that once you've gotten all of those. So Americans continue, of course, to count calories and worry about eating a balanced diet. And the government continues to publish nu nutrition guides. Of course, we know my plate is the most recent version. Um, it was Wilbur Olin Atwater's calorimeter studies that started us down this path. Um, and finally, I just wanted to close by saying that by looking at the history and evolution of government activity related to food, we can gain insight into contemporary policies, legislation, and activities, see how government has influenced, and, or I'm sorry, see how history has influenced and set the context for our current 
situation um, and how things that happened long ago continue to affect what we eat. So food is just one of the many subjects that you can explore in the records of the National Archives. And I think it just kind of goes to show that what is inscribed on this statue in front of the Archives building is true. Thank you.